You're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. Welcome back, everyone, to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. In this episode, I'm speaking with Lou Schildemeyer, who's the principal of Lou S. Design Associates. He's been in the business over 30 years, and in that illustrious career, he has designed over 700 restaurants, 400 bars, 1,500 food service facilities, and he must have seen it all. So from time to time, you know, we need to give our place a makeover, or maybe we're starting a new restaurant from scratch, and we need a professional. So don't miss this episode. We're going to talk all about lighting design, acoustics, traffic flow, the importance of the kitchen to the overall design. We can talk about how design details increase profit. We're going to talk all about cutting food service waste, reducing spoilage, and whether or not your restaurant should stay open during a renovation or close, and how to keep that customer base coming back for more even if you do close that restaurant. There's so much in this episode, okay? The build-out, the design details, the importance of meeting code, practicality. You might have these really wild, outrageous ideas that you really want to execute, and Lou will bridge the gap between what is feasible, what is practical, and what will be really, really cool in the final design. So hang on, here we go. Welcome back, everyone, to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Of course, these are engaging topics that help restaurants build their brands, rock their profits, deliver amazing guest service experiences. But there's so much that is foundational to great restaurant design. So I'm really pleased to have Mr. Lou Schildemeyer, and he is from a company. He actually is the principal of Lou S. Design Associates in the great Pacific Northwest. Welcome to the show, Lou. Hey, how you doing? I'm great. Happy Glad to have me on. It's fun. <laughs> Happy to have you back, Lou. This is terrific. So, you know, you have such an illustrious history in the restaurant and hospitality space. We go back 30 years and you've designed so many different restaurants and bars and food service facilities. I mean, it counts in the thousands. I mean, you've worked with yeah. so many different clients, so your expertise, expertise is so broad ranging. Can you give us a little backstory, how you got into the hospitality business and what your experience is and how you got to where you are now? Sure. Thank you. Well, and actually now, I just celebrated my 40th year in the industry, October of 2019. So how I got into it, I really took my first architectural drafting course in high school, in sophomore in high school, uh, down in Southern California. And it just, it just was my gift. I knew it. And so I started to take a shop class, metal sculpture, I had my own metal sculpture business when I was normal kids or in high school or doing that. So I've always been an entrepreneurial type designer too, but what I got blessed with I uh, got good grades. I got into uh, Arizona State, which is one of the top architecture and design schools. But my class, my graduating class of 1979, was the very first class that offered a degree, a Bachelor of Science degree, design science in interior architecture. So it was half commercial interior design and half commercial architecture. And that degree in my portfolio got me my first job, which was, again, a blessing. I was an in-house designer on the in-house design staff of Weston Hotels. Now, when I joined in 80, because I graduated in 79, it was uh, Western International Hotels, a wholly owned subsidiary of United Airlines. And in the time I was there, we changed to Weston. I was there five years. Then, so a lot of people don't realize this, besides Chicago and some other places, the Northwest, especially the Seattle, uh, Puget Sound area, is known as kind of the seat of hospitality design and restaurant design. And I'm the last one in this market that got to work for both. So the other company I went to work for, for 13 years, was a company called Brody Dorman. Now, that is where I learned the the food service planning. But I'm also a certified lighting designer. And I've been that. So basically, I wear three hats. Uh, The uh, food service planner, I am an FCSI consultant, which is Food Service Consultant Sign International. So I'm an FCSI uh, consultant. I'm an interior architect. And I'm a certified lighting designer. So... More often than not, I get involved with every facet of the end of part of my client's business from start to finish. But because I've doing it so long, I have a resource. I'm like, you know, you're a resource for me. I refer you to my clients when they need expertise like this, like you have. But so I'm more than a designer. I am basically their business advisor, helping them to 
make this thing happen, either brand new from nothing or, you know, remodel. So that's, I'm the only one left in this market that does what I do. And I'm young, I'm only 63, been doing it 40 years. So I never not did have done this. So <laughs> it's just, I'm really honored. I mean, it's, it's just fun. I love to help and in, in, in help people's business. So it doesn't sound like you have a retirement plan in the future. No, <laughs> no way. It. Are you kidding me? There's no reason to. I'm, and my wife's my business partner. Yes. And, you know, I get to travel, uh, I get most of it paid for because being an FCSI consultant, I get to go to factories and I'm actually going to be taking this year uh, uh, two concepts I'm going to help this guy develop and take further. Uh, one's uh, it's called Fiesta Taqueria and Tequila Bar. And the other one he has is a, uh, a East Indian concept uh, called Karma. And we're so I'm going to be taking him like up here. We have Woodstone to different factories, to local, you know, uh, food manufacturers reps <clears throat> that have test kitchens to really, and I'm doing that on an hourly consulting rate mm -hmm. starting up front. Then once we have everything dialed in and we're starting on a, a new project or a remodel of something you might take over, then I do a fee, you know, for everything. But it's all part of what I do. Um, but this is fun because he's been an experienced restaurant, 30 years he's been in the industry. He's from Southern California, came up here in 20, um, I think 2001. But we were introduced by mutual, as you know, connections are everything. Right. Yes. We're, um, we're we're introduced to by a guy I've known for years, and we just it was magic. We just <laughs> I took him to a casino. I did these non tribal mini casinos. I uh, did 13 of those in our state, uh, an enhanced card rooms that they call them mini casinos. Right. Right. So he was in my environment, but that's not me. That's me working with people and collaborating. I have never ever think I have a style. You can't tell a Lewis design associate. I don't want them to because it's not about me. It is them. It is their business. I'm there to help them, to give them information, but to ca I'm a vision caster. So, but if they give me their vision, then of course we work together and I have to meet code and all that okay. kind of stuff. But right, at right. the end of the day, it, it comes down to, yes, once you get the vision, I have to then implement it and make it work, you know, from space planning. But at the end of the day, it has to be something that they can make money with. Well, this is really uh, a life. lifestyle for you. You mentioned the word yes. work, but it doesn't sound like you're working, Lou. They say that oh, I, if you well, love what you do, you'll never work another day in your life. And that sounds like what you're doing. I love it. Uh, I, I do. I just, I wake up every morning yeah. and uh, I, I just, whenever I get up, I'm up, but I, usually I'm early riser. I always have been. Mm -hmm. uh, I come from farming and uh, chicken ranching families on both sides. I'm a fourth generation native from Southern California. But I've been in the Northwest now 40 years, so I'm, I have webs between my feet. And you're, you and I are almost in line with each other in terms of our latitude. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I know. <laughs> across, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Pretty close. No, so true. yeah. So I mean, so I, I, I just, you know, whoever comes across my path. But this is the key. I only, only, only design for independent restaurant owners or groups. I do not do national. I have no interest in that. I'm here for the mom and pop or for a, a emerging one, but once they get yeah. too many, I do concept and I can do a full, you know, design drawings and for permit, but I choose not to want to incre increase my firm. I've been there, done that as a partner. So it's my wife and I, so I do a lot of conceptual ones or first ons, but then I, if they want to do a bunch, I said, that's not me, but here are some firms that they are good at that after I've done everything I need to do to implement it to make it work and then they can just replicate and do the d design and do, I mean, do the drawings and whatever. So that's really what I, I, I enjoy the most, you know, is, is that. I love that you've taken a stance for the independent operator. Yeah. And that is really Absolutely. the backbone and the foundation of this industry is the, Absolutely. you know, the mom and pop, the husband and wife, the, yep. you know, the they're in the trenches on a daily basis yep. trying to make the most of what they have and not only just making a living, but putting out a great product and caring about yes. the service and the quality of the customer experience. Yes. But, you know, <laughs> that's well, and the craft and the craft industry. You and I both in this business industry for a while. Yeah. I remember back when the steakhouses and, and most of them good ones, yeah. they butchered their own meat and all that. And that went away, but now it's back. It's yes. never <laughs> gone away to a point, but <laughs> now I like it because there's so many, as you know, the industry has changed. So much, yeah. and, the, and the public demands it. They do not want, they want to see what's be, how they're being prepared. They want to know what yeah. they're eating. So that's a big thing, too. That's, I think, it's, it's always been there, but I think it, now it's in main, more mainstream again than it was, you know, say 30 years ago. 
Well, you know, this, this business, these restaurants, I mean, mm -hmm. there's no one size fit all in what you no. do for a typical client. So let's talk about the process sure. itself. Okay. In a typical client, like where do you begin? Is it an interview process? It's like, how do you get to know the client and what they've got now and where right. they go with it? Well, a uh, good example would be one I'm very honored. I started it, uh, it was introduced to them, it's called Vin Dong. And, and that means um, uh, Far East in in uh, uh north in south vietnamese uh so get this uh again coming from southern california mm -hmm. and i was in high school 70 to 74 well the boat people you know saw Paul right. saigon yeah they started to come over so i saw all that well it lived i was right all around it uh the gentleman who i'm working with now is his kids but he brought pho to the pacific northwest the he's the original guy that brought pho but mm -hmm. he's a full he's a full menu he's not just a pho house right oh. We're talking 72 menu items yeah. and, and 10 That's specials. So the parents are not involved. They're there, but they're not in the day to day. Right. Right, right. But their kids, they're not kids. He's 54 and she's 48. They've been in shoulder to shoulder with their parents for 30 years. Well, we are moving this institution across the street. This is in an international district called, um, well, it's our international district in Tacoma, but it's not. It's mostly Cambodian, uh, Vietnamese, uh, Laotian. It's just that's it's kind of like a little Vietnam. They call it, but they call it international district. Well, they own the family's been there so long that they've acquired all these buildings. Oh. So I get to I get to do a three for one here. I get to take a icon, relocate them, do a complete as built. I've already done that complete. They're going to do a complete gut, and then I have to get structural here. So from that one, they're an established one. They know what they do, but I am introducing to like change their life. They're used to doing it, the old process with, with stock pots and that. I just, they didn't know what a kettle was. And I'm not kidding you. And I'm going to lean in because that's what they did. They go like this, the production, what? And I say, it's going to change your life. So for me, learning their heart, because the heart is the heart. The engine that drives these businesses is the kitchen first. And if you have a bar, there's two engines. Correct. So I don't care about the rest of the stuff yet. Yeah. I have to worry about, you know, egress and things like that, certain yes. code things. But if that's not right, mm. I don't care what you do because they have to implement every day. To your point, in my opinion, they're the entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurs in independent business owners, man. I mean, they got it all on the line every day and they have to implement every day. So my job is to help them to be able to together as a collaboration. And that's what I always stress. It is not me. I just happen to know what I know. And I know the codes, but I listen to them yeah. and I hear their heart. And this is my heart because uh, you've said this and it's true. I care more about their business. If I, I get paid for it, yes, I get paid very well when I do these things. But that's not why I do it. I do it because I care and I love working with these folks. So that's a good example of an institution. Then I got somebody who's never been in the industry. And I have vetted some of these people to say, you really don't want to do this unless you get somebody of all on your team that has a background. I can't tell you how many times I've had people, and I've probably vetted about 30 in the last 10 years, and I've made them see on about six or seven, they shouldn't do this unless they get somebody involved. And they've gone away, and some of them just go away, and they, whatever, they do it, and they fail, That, but then they come back. So you were right. And I said, look, I'm just trying to help you. <laughs> I'm not trying to... You know, so so from that standpoint, it's I then I start bringing in my other experts that are like an MAS consultant would be for from from FCSI or whoever, but they're menu planners. They, they you know they're operational people like you, but but you also have to. I have to have that front. Years, I mean, yeah, I do. Well, I people. I bring in the right yeah. people, yes, or I'm brought in. Sometimes yeah. I'm I'm a surgeon. I'm so specialized. Yeah that they'll do the building and all that, but the owner hires me to do everything else. So basically they're doing the building and, and that, and I take it from the walls in. It, it is pretty typical when I'm involved on a team. And I, typically I'm leading the team. It's my firm's leading, but I don't, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a licensed architect. So uh, I bring those in. That's with Vin Dong, the one I just talked about. When I did all my due diligence and, and I saw that, cause I have sons, I have three sons. And they help me, and I get to pay them good money an hour to help me do this process to start the process. Because unless I get that done, and I get an AutoCAD, and I know what I got, but then we uncovered all this stuff. It's a 1942 building. Mm. So, 
So right. we're gonna we're gonna have stuff involved, but that's all been mitigated, and the fees are less going forward for the other disciplines because they have my complete package, pictures with with field notes and everything, so they can give my client a very fair price and accurate price for the structural engineering and the work that they have to do. So I save the client money. They get me involved initially. And then we do the discovery. And then I go, okay, this and this and this we're going to need. So, but here's two or three that I know very well. And I just give them the package and say, here, put this together. And then it's all directly to them. I don't have any influence or say in, it goes through my firm. No. And that's what I do too for the independent people in general. I will not run, or I, and I won't let anybody run my fees through their firm, like I'm an architect. No, if you want to work with me, this is my arrangement. I'm a businessman, and it's for the client. So you're direct with him, and we'll work together as a team. But at the end of the day, if you don't get paid, that's your problem. Right. right? Yes, <laughs> so yes, it's yes. business. I mean, it, let's face it. it, it we're, we're in this to, to help people, but you got to think about the business first. So get that set. But yeah, so so it really varies with their experience, with who referred me. But a lot of times I've been doing this so long, I get a call or LinkedIn is a big one for me. Mm -hmm. That's where you and I met. Yes, yes. But I was going to say, yeah. we connected on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so I mentor right now uh, four or five other designers who has found me over the last six years, young designers that want to be restaurant designers like me. They're at interior designers or maybe someone's an architect, right. just young, 30s. You know, I say that's young for me. but so that I do that too, but I, I want to further the industry because there's not a lot of me around in this country that I know for sure. There's probably five or six of me in other parts of the country that have this skill set that do it all themselves. Not, and I'm not bragging. I'm just saying we need more of that in our industry because, as you know, there's a lot of people that do this stuff and they don't know what they're doing. They don't have a clue about what they're designing. They don't. They're just. They just. Why? How could they? It's, it's, it's so many moving parts. Right, I mean, absolutely. It's not, you know, so, so anyway, that, that's really, it, it varies from somebody giving me a referral now that I've been doing it so long. Most of it is word of mouth or referral or LinkedIn or somebody like you, you know, just people that I, I really see value that I can bless you and then vice versa. But I, you're the first one. You're the only one that I've ever put on my website as, as a link. No, but you guys, you're great. You don't, you do a great job. So I would, I want to support you. Well, you know, I, I totally agree with what you said before. We don't do this for the money. We do it because yeah. of passion. We want to help people. We want to peep, you know, we want people to succeed based on our expertise. Absolutely. And it's so gratifying when you're able <clears throat> to take somebody's business to the next level and build a relationship with people. I think that's Oh yeah. Oh, and, and it only it only does goodwill because if you yeah. do that, which you want to anyway, but the byproduct of benefit yeah. is you get recommended. And they won't even shop. They'll just say, call Lou. You don't need to talk to anybody else. That's what he did for me. And I, I'm just, that's who I am. I don't try to purport anything. I just do what I do. You know? There's so many basics to what you do. Foundational basics, yeah. such as traffic flow and acoustics and lighting yeah. design and finishes. And all those things have to come together into a very functional, appealing, aesthetic package that yeah. works for the client, delivers the wow factor that the customers come in and they say, wow, right. beautiful, this is great, but it works. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a challenge for you. What is the hardest part about what you do? Okay, probably the hardest part is when we have a concept that we know will work, but we either have certain code issues that we are, our hands are tied. We'd like to do certain things, but Right, it, right. From the from the look standpoint, and what I've noticed in the last uh, probably eight, six, seven years now, the Instagram moment, you know, it used to be we would call it feature wall or something, but having those things are important. But at the end of the day, I don't care if none of that stuff is there and they can get it out the door and they're making money, we can always come back and do a refresh. But to start, it is important to have all those aspects, but it comes from the client, the owner. If they have that, because they, as you know, the wheels can fall off if they've been the most successful. So it really comes down to, in my opinion, too, more and more the branding, the stuff I do is important. But if they don't implement these other things, the business is too tough. If they don't have a social media, so I more and more, and I would say in the last three years, 
I asked them up front, okay, do you have all these people? If you don't, or you're making a mistake and us going forward, because here's a good example. Okay, I design those things, great. And they have my renderings if they we go depends on what level we go to in terms of level of involvement. I get involved with the drawings and do all the design and da-da-da. But do they want renderings to show as here's coming soon, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. That's usually a separate thing. It's part of the process, but a lot of times they want me to go even more detailed and like I use SketchUp for my 3D and look make it look more photorealistic, whatever. They can use those on their windows. You don't put paper over the windows. You say what the heck is coming, and you start marketing that online. Yeah. If, you know, and people don't—they don't do that. So for me, yeah. Yeah. You're right. it, that's that's something that I think that's drama. <laughs> it is. It's drama, but it's excitement. So all those things that you were saying are, are givens if you know what you're doing. So the, what I've seen, I've had to go back and fix so many. For example, fabrics, uh, vinyl, things that are falling apart because unfortunately. Those designers were residential designers. They were a friend of the owner's wife or whatever. Yes. And I've had to fix that. So it, it's important that clients interview their designers. Don't just take the word. Like for me, don't take the word of somebody else. If you want me to work for you, then let's have a meeting and let's talk about this. And I can show you this. And this is why I do this and this and this. I'll give them enough information, but I need the information too so I can put a fair and an accurate fee proposal together for the scope of work I'm gonna do. So all those little things though, it comes from the beginning. If those aren't there in the beginning and they're not willing to like say, oh, we just want you to do a minor thing and that, and they don't understand the process and what it takes and how far, this is like having a baby. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, 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 there's so much involved, yep. but they think it's easy. The, the funniest thing I'll tell you, man, in doing this so long now, for the firstly for the the concept of the food and the drink and whatever i have so many people that i say okay i need your detailed menu this is part of my parameter these are my checklists yes yes okay you, you you got a place or you're getting a place or if you don't have a place you and you want me to help you you have an existing restaurant say you're taking over you haven't signed a lease well then please let me go with you to that place i don't charge you for one time if they want to go to multiple place and i charge them 70 dollars an hour as needed but i i can look at that look at their menu if you don't have that i can't talk to you and i won't i say okay you have a detailed menu with every item you're going to sell and pricing and do you have a detailed drink menu and if you have alcohol i mean everything because that's my that's my bible but a lot of people i can't tell you people i worked with over the time four or five concepts over 12 14 years they go oh we're going to do a, a chicken place lou or we're going to do a steak place i go okay where's your menu and what they don't they want it they don't want to do the work now they just want they think okay no you as an owner need to do that up front before you even talk to somebody like me because i've had it happen so many times that they go to some architect quote who has no clue they, he's a they, who cares if you don't have a clue about this business don't do it please you're wasting your client's time you're going to look stupid because I've cleaned up a lot of those, and I'm not yeah, bragging. I'm just being actual. I'm being honest here. I'm being real. I'm no, clearly. <laughs> don't go there. And so all those things up front. So if anything on this podcast, if these people that listen to this and they're thinking about a place, please, please, please do your menu first, your drink first. Get somebody that is in the industry. If you're not already involved in your team, if you're not of that, you're going to die. You're not. You're going to go bankrupt. I'm sorry. You just will. Unless you got just happens you're lucky very 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 lucky no that's not it's very rare very rare <laughs> so but yeah. then once you get that vet that professional so somebody like me say for example okay do you only do food service design do i need to have an interior designer that has specialized or has done a lot of restaurants and food service do i need an architect depending on the state you're in and i can do in my state anything that's four thousand square feet or under without an architectural license stamp and most often than not I have to have though other people involved, like in my state, this would be a good one for them to check. So the due diligence part, it's called um, deferment versus um, having not having to defer. So deferment is any city, and most of my cities in our state have it now, you can't say, I'm gonna say bitter design on plumbing, electrical, HVC, and stuff like that. They have to have those design drawings up front, and that requires an MEP, which is, 
mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineer. They yeah. take my information that I do, my rough ends and all the lighting design, yeah. but I'm not an engineer. So it's a lot of more and more around this country. So that's, I think, important for your listeners to know. That is an important thing. If you're going to the city, go to call up the city. You can go online too, but sometimes they don't say that. The big question asked them is, do you allow deferment for permitting process or do you not allow deferment? Because you're going to pay for it either way. You're going to, so you're going to pay me. You're going to then have to pay people that I would coordinate with, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineers to get it all together to then go in for a, a, prove, a permit for a tenant improvement or build out or whatever, freestanding versus you still always have to do the health separate and the liquor. But that's pretty common in every state. But that's new. That's more and more states or cities are finding that they just want everything now rather than the non-deferment. I mean, sorry, the where you can defer mm -hmm. is where... <clears throat> I would do my thing and I have all my drawings. These are better designed. So in the process of putting together a package by a general contractor, their subcontractors, electrical plumbing, they have to have engineered drawings as part of their price in the bid to the contractor. Makes sense. But in the end of the day, you're paying for it. So I always like to help clients know up front, these are what you're going to have to pay for and not be surprised like all of a sudden, oh, well, now like those Vin Dong, well, now we need a structural engineer. Well, that's going to be another eight, nine thousand dollars, whatever, right? Ten thousand depends on the size of the project. But those are things they need to know up front, right? Before they do anything. So for me, it's getting as much upfront cost as you can, and then when they're working with me, they go through the preliminary design phase. We get enough where they can then have a preliminary bid done to make sure. Because you can be, I, as long as I've been doing this, you can still be close. But every city has, and every square, there's just there's too many variables. To to unless you have somebody like me or somebody that really can do all these things and get you a good set of preliminary plans to get a price on because that and that's in my fee proposal. These are preliminary design to get to you to budget pricing. That's yeah, is so important. The fee schedule. I mean, yeah, it sounds to me that it's very challenging to set a budget without the unexpected that is inevitable is it not yeah, it's like, it is stay on budget and, and that's so important because yeah. it's lifeblood is their business oh yeah they can only afford to spend so much whatever that budget is right, right. something that you don't anticipate happens that you can't foresee but right. now suddenly we hit this roadblock i mean right it happens what well, it happens all the time what what like i just had one last year uh i've worked with them known them for eight years we took a it was called lap post coffee roasters and yeah. they had a roasting facility in their home, they did convert their two car garage into an FDA because, see, green beans are not food, but you still have to have FDA and uh, another. It's not health hmm. department. Okay. So anyway, so we their dream was to take that roasting facility and move it and have a cafe barista design around. Well, I did that. And they can see on my website, it's called Lamp Post Coffee. So, um, the, but what happened was they planned everything to, like, to everything. But imagine this. Never think about it, but it could happen. They forgot sales tax. Oh. They didn't factor in tax. Yeah, so their good. slush fund. Woo. <laughs> so right. what we had to do was just value engineer a few things. Like I had my safety floor, which I use standard in the kitchens and behind. We could do it behind the breast area, but we couldn't do it in the back area with the scullery and that. So we just used so it, every little you, you do, you have to. There's you so I tell clients, I said, look. There's going to be stuff that's going to happen, and I we don't some of it we're never going to know. It's just it's going to be the it's the process of design, but then of build out. You don't know, you know, unless it's totally. But here's the thing I want to share with the, the the listeners too. No matter what you do, we have the highest concentration of plumbing, electrical, and drainage in the built environment. When I say the built environment, I mean all of commercial design and architecture is food service. Besides a clean room in a hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe a chip man. So what I'm saying is that is a given. So if you go into an existing place and there's not been a food service in there, you're going to be cutting up that floor. And so there's these, these six costs, but you don't know how much, because once we lay it out, yeah. you've got a, a, a set fee to bring in that machine, but then you go every foot to cut, you know, it's just there. And I, this is because I only do this and I'm very involved. Most clients hire me to be the other owner agent, or to be a project management working with the contractors. A lot of times I'm, so I'm very, I'm not just this guy that sits in the office or go out and meets the client and just uh, that I'm onto another project. Typically I'm involved through the end of the, of the construction. 
most often, more than not. So that has given me more insight to help future clients. But I know a lot of the pitfalls that happen. And I'm just honest with them. I said, like Vin Dong, I didn't know. There's no way I would know that. How bad, it, or not bad, but how evasive we had to do and see. So we're doing it in phases. So good example. I just met with them yesterday. We have um, uh, all the preliminary design done, but now I have to do a demolition plan. And they have to have asbestos testing to make sure there isn't. So we have to do that first. Then the demolition plan, they'll submit with the contractor they're going to pick. They'll do a demo. And then we'll go in by a walk with the structural engineer. They've already put one in their contract that I recommended. So the pieces are in place, but I have to stop now. I'm ahead. I have to slow down and wait for the other parties to catch up. Okay. So that's, again, all part of that process. But didn't know that until we saw up in the investigation. And a lot of people, they don't see the need for, no, let's knock this out and do that stuff. No, <laughs> that's where they get into trouble. That's where they go belly up and never open because they don't think it's that big of a deal and they get into it. That's like me saying, oh, I'm going to be a chef. I'm going to go behind the, even though I've done this for life, never, I've never cooked in the commercial kitchen. Like, I'm really going to go back there. <laughs> you know? Are you making me laugh here, right? <laughs> Pretty much. So, I mean, it's all about you got to value if you value your business, you need to value the people you help set that business up. I'm just as important as a lawyer that writes up the contracts mm -hmm. and any of that kind of stuff. Because at the end of the day, we're all we're all service professionals, professional service professionals. That's why we do, and that's what you hire us to do. So I don't know. Sometimes I just see people that they they don't think about that. Oh well, and I'm not putting dealers down, but they're in the business to make money with the equipment. They have some decent diet, but they're not in it for the client to like I am. I'm an independent consultant. I'm an independent. I'm only design fee based only. I'm not. I don't. I'm not beholden to anybody. But so you're also designing for return on investment. Yes, absolutely. You know? And I think that's a good point that we can talk about now. How okay. can great design details actually increase profits in a restaurant? Right. Oh yeah. Yes. Well, several ways. I always look at how is that going to be a functional thing that is something that's going to hold up and not look nice for maybe you know a year and then fall apart and then all of a sudden they got to replace it I, the things that i specify for example i take the the my design philosophy for how, the front of the house and lighting and all that but mostly front of the house finishes and look is disney they do a great job of it they always have if it's high up in the air you can't touch it it can be fake it could look real but it's fake Right. That saves you money. Okay. Down low, yeah. be more real or mix Makes it. Sense. I I do a lot of these things where I have a wainscot mm. and it's laminate that looks like wood, but the, then there's trim and, and, you know, whatever that's real wood. But it's easy to maintain. You can wipe it down. You don't have it, every wood. That's the biggest mistake I see a lot of interior designers that are good interior designers, but they don't know the industry. They don't know how stuff gets beat up and the stuff looks like whatever after you know a year it's just beat because they don't take the time and say to the client this we can do this with like say solid surface i can make it look almost like stone but it's not going to fall or you know and i would never some people don't even know this which shocks me a bar you say you're doing an old time bar and you want that look of marble well you don't use real marble because the acids in the drink and eats the marble that's why if you ever go have a it's true. You go. You got them back there. You got old bars. We did too. It has, it's got the. It's, so it's the it's the use of the material that either it's real for a reason and it will hold up, or if it's not, we'll make it as close as we can. But at the end of the day, it's all about return on investment and how then every day they can maintain that quickly, and they're not like fighting it and they have to have it refinished or whatever. And now in flooring. Same thing. I have not specified carpet in a commercial establishment for a long time. And if I do, it's carpet tiles, it's squares, not broad loom. I don't do, which is, you know, you stretch it on stuff. Mm -hmm. Most of the stuff I use these days are either, it's called lux LVT, luxury pile tile, or, or you know, it looks like real I'm wood. And that's, product, sure. it has, it has like 20, well, the one I'm using a lot here now is, is Specta manufacturer. They have a 25 year wear layer guarantee on a commercial 
So I use it in bars, but never behind the thing. That's a different, that's my safety floor. So I have certain standards, like for a kitchen, the ceiling, if it's a drop ceiling and not a, we call it a hard lid, not a jet board ceiling. I use a suspended ceiling. So it's easy to get to the mechanicals and everything, but I use vinyl coated jet board. It cleans well, but it has a little weight to it. So it doesn't pucker. And, you know, I've seen just stuff I've had to replace that they did the wrong thing. Then my 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 walls are FRP, which is fiberglass reinforced polyboard, smooth. That's the key, not the pebble. And then I use the Altro, the safety floor. You know, I don't. I, don't, I haven't spec a quarry tile floor in a kitchen for thirty years, or behind a bar. So those are my kind of bulletproof standards. And then you come out to the front of the house, and it depends on the theme and and what, but. I have standards of, we call it double rubs. Wiesenbach is the, is the standard for fabric durability and vinyl durability in seating. I will not specify anything that doesn't meet that. And then I have some really good furniture sources. One in particular I've had recently, and they have a resource of custom furniture. They have own manufacturer in Illinois, but they have at least 50 manufacturers and they specialize in restaurant furniture. So what I do with them is I get with my client and I say, here, these we use these, then the client can get them direct. He didn't have to buy them from a secondhand party and pay a markup. He gets a direct from the from the manuf from the this conglomerate. So those are the value added things besides durability in that that I that's my mantra is what can I get this client and specify this client, because I've been this all I do, get millwork direct, get whatever they can direct, because as you know, this it's it's a tight margin. And I don't have never believed a contractor gets his money. He gets to build the thing out, his con his subs. But you come to custom millwork and all that kind of stuff, there's no reason he gets to write a, some percentage points on that, in my opinion. So if you're working with me, that doesn't happen. But it, I think that should be more standard in the industry instead of it being, because everybody knows if they can do one, they'll do more if they're successful. But the margins is only food and labor. That's all you control. You know that. Exactly. And so that's where I try to up front, because if I can mitigate that up front and get that down, then I look at a place being 20 years is my specs. I have places right now that have been open 20 years and we've had to change some fabrics and maybe carpet or whatever. But the, the basic bones are still there. But it's them. They have to. They're good operators. They take care of their stuff. So you can specify some great stuff. It's going to be durable and look good. But if they don't take care of it, that's on them. Absolutely true. You know, you know, one of the biggest challenges must be a restaurant <clears throat> operator that recognizes he needs a makeover. Yes. And he's going to bring you in. But now, depending on the scope of the work, mm -hmm. do they continue to operate under a renovation situation? Mm -hmm. Do they close down completely? And if so, how do you put a positive spin to keep your customer right. ready to That's come back as soon as it's ready to go? Like, there's yeah. no balance there. Like, what do, what do there you There is. Well, there's a really good that's a really good question because again it varies every project's different. But for example, they have a restaurant and a bar elements. If they can and they want to do all of it. Yeah. And we we call it a refresh. Yes. Uh, upgrade. So if they want to do that, ideally we never want to close that kitchen unless it's going to be closed and we close it and we gotta redo it or we're cleaning it all out or whatever. But if it's strictly front of the house and and uh you know under bar is easier than a than a kitchen to do the right. food service side of it. Would be to close one and do and leave the other one open, and vice versa. But at the end of the day, I had one uh, last year again. I had done like the year before about eight nine projects designs, and all of them were open, either implemented, new, refreshed, or whatever last year. So I had several of those. There were all those like you mentioned, different reasons. Well, we had one that was a two story restaurant called Pellegrino's Italian Kitchen, and they've been there forever. Well, I did 100% refreshed up and down. And a little bit of stuff in the back, but they took the time. They made the decision because as we thought of, talked about it, and they had all the contractor bids, and they came over the contract. We had everything set to, to pull the trigger, right, to do it in phases. And then when they looked at it and they looked at their kitchen that we didn't touch, we just they took everything out of the kitchen and redid the walls and then cleaned all the equipment. So they were doing that separate away from everything else because it, it just that was the space allowed us to do that so a lot of it is what what you really could do feasibly that makes sense you start tenting it off and you're running around yeah it may, it's not good for clientele i mean they're gonna go 
what's wrong with these people? You know, it's just not a good image. So I would say more often than not, I, I recommend that we do close it. But I know it's a tough decision. We're talking, could be three weeks. That was three weeks. But they said they would never have not done that. But it's hard. Mm. It is, it's a tough decision. It's a business decision. So I just try to give them all the information and make sure that we have all the numbers together. And then they can say, okay, Mr. Contractor, we're going to do this in phases. Okay, well, here's, we're going to have to, it's going to cost a little more logistically as we go into this. And you never know where you're going to find. That's the problem. Sometimes you might find something in a hidden wall or something, and then the inspector comes in, and then you're going, crap. So then you're <laughs> you're shut down for longer, but yeah. that's the nature of, of a remodel versus of new. So those would be the two, I guess, far spectrums would be a total gut remodel where you're just taking it out. You're going to close anyway to phasing, which can be profitable and okay. It's just a case-by-case -case basis. So it's... It is really, it is what it is. But uh, I would say that if it's small enough space, you want to close it. You know, unless you're over, I would say, and you have a bar restaurant, say you're over 2,000, 25 to 2,800 square feet plus, and you, you, it, it made sense, that would, I would suggest to phase it. Hmm. But if you're going with, you know, 1,500, 1,800, and it's all one space, no. Just take just bite the bullet and do it. It'll, and then you, that gives you as an owner more chance to tool up other things that you maybe have been wanting to. Cause we're doing our thing, right? The design's done. It's they're implementing it. You can come out and visit whatever, but concentrate on your operations, work with you, somebody like you, that's the time. And then, you, you know, right for you, as you know, you can train them and do all that stuff that you got, you do part of your stuff, but that really can pay benefits to them in the long run and, and give them a jump start too. That's just a thought I just thought of as I was thinking about it. Well, you bring a tremendous amount <clears throat> of experience and years and years of so many different clients to bear on any given project. But then a typical client is going to have a vision in their mind of what they yeah. want to see. And now you've got to balance the practicality, their idea. You mentioned the code issue and how important yes. codes are. And then from an engineering standpoint, so many things just might not be feasible. So exactly, you have to influence a client's thinking so that they get sort of what they want, but realistically, that's not yeah. possible, but here's a great alternative, right? Exactly. And, and like the good example is yesterday. So mm -hmm. because of, okay, and this is really interesting because I didn't know they're going to be there. The original owners had just come back from Vietnam vacation in Vietnam in their original country. And they came to the meeting. I was—I didn't know it was going to happen. And that's fine. I don't care. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mama, who I could tell was the leader, she sat in the meeting. Dad said hi and went because they were cleaning their hood that day. They're, listen, they're open 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day except Tuesday. No, and kidding. they've been doing this for 30 years. Oh. I mean, far, but. <laughs> they yeah. live there, but that's their life. Yeah. Oh, oh, my God. I'm serious. I have never experienced a client this deep. Wow. And they don't. The, but they, these things were going to change. Yeah. They're all excited because they're, they're used to taking a stock pot and put it. Oh, my God. So anyway, what, wow. what I found with them is that, okay, we like this layout, but we'd like to do this. And I said, well, this is my problem. I have this column. I can't change unless the structural engineer says, but I'm not there yet. I'm not a structural engineer. So I said, okay, I'm to a point where I can't go any farther. We got to do all these things, get gutted, and then look. And then maybe I can do that. But if I can't, this is why I can't move. They want she, the the, uh, the mom. Well, put the bathroom back there. I said, ma'am, we can't do that because of uh, code. You can't have a health code will not allow public to walk through the kitchen to go to a public restroom. Right. So That's most true. of my stuff, really, to be honest with you, I fall on the code and I just say, we can't do the code. End of story. So I, I, I use that a lot yeah. because it is the truth and I have to do it, but it mitigates. Yeah. Once It's kind of like, an officer of the law, you get pulled over. Well, you're going to get a ticket. Well, why am I getting a ticket? Well, the whatever, right? Well, I'm under, in my case, in the Washington State, it's whack, Washington State. Oh. I, but I have to I have to look at health code. Yeah. Right, if right. If we have liquor, liquor, life safety, which That's is an international building code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, international building code. So I have to look at two more codes than most people that design built environment. They're doing offices or non-food service related design for clients and for businesses so having those extra codes a lot of it drives some of the design because good example we have to have two prep sinks we have to have one for proteins 
and one for um, uh, vet non-proteins. It used to not be that way. We used to be able to do a, bre a bleach protocol where you would, you know, do proteins and bleach that prep sink, and then no, can't do that anymore. In our, it's pretty much every you can't do that. So those things, they're because that's what the mom said. She goes, "Why? We don't need that." I go, and then she had to interpret because she's has broken English. The kids are, are very, you know, gentrified and, and Americanized, and so they then they 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 explained it to her. To mm -hmm. her. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, but it, you know, it is a lot of that, really. To be honest with you, that's what I really rely on. Yes. That I, the, as a way to say, okay, we can't do this, but we can do this. But it's more functionality and getting. I always look at mise in place and pods, but that's based on the menu. But I also like them. Okay, this is what you're used to doing. You have all these cooks that do this, and they're busting their butts. Now, if I can give you two pieces of equipment that'll change your life, wouldn't you want to look at that? And that, so I kind of, I'm a salesman. I mean, we're sa all, all of us are in sales. But I'm doing it practical. It's not like I want to sell them because I'm not making any money on that piece of equipment. I'm making money on my design piece. So I, that's the that's the advantage of an independent consultant like myself that isn't tied to anybody. So really, it's a code. But then when it comes to the look and the theme, it's their vision. And since the only kind of ethnic restaurant or, or that I haven't done is Ethiopian, and I've done many. So I've done every kind of ethnicity, any kind of theme you can think of. But there's always new things. Like right now, I'm, I'm probably going to do a vegetable-based, uh, you know, uh, uh, restaurant this year, you know, with, with vegetable-based uh, food, cocktails. That's brand new. I mean, come on, that's new. We've had vegan, but this is all a whole new thing. And the biggest thing that I see, the biggest thing that changed that I've seen, and I think it's going to be backlash, but it's for the independents, is having a place for third-party deliveries and pickups. That is last year. There, I just saw the statistic from Terranomics, which is our statisticians for the whole food service industry, and it's the biggest change: seventy percent shift to millennials doing that and not going to a restaurant every. They order it, but these guys, especially independents, are going. We don't have anything to place it. All these people are coming in. We're getting this business, but they're having to pay so much for the third party. A lot of them. I'm actually working with a group right now. They're going to do, we're thinking about doing a ghost kitchen and have, they have similar fare and then they pool that and they have their own, instead of these third party guys, which are starting to eat into everybody's profits. I don't think those third party guys are going to be around much longer. A lot of them. I think they're going to see a shift in the next two years. Maybe, maybe Uber will be around. Yeah. And maybe, but I think those guys are 86 because the industry is not going to take that, that hit. You know, the big guys are already doing it. They're, they're saying that, that we're taking it on of ourselves. So I just think these things come along, but you have to mitigate those. And, and and now I'm doing it up front. Like I did that for Vendong. We got a place, you know, so it's already going to be built in. And so I think there's always going to be something, as you know, this food industry is, is static in certain things. There's certain dinosauric things about the industry, like right. a flat top's a flat top's a flat right, top, right. unless it's more it's efficient. Technology. <laughs> but there is a lot of other, like speed ovens. That's the biggest category. Yeah. that I see from a designer mm -hmm. and, and helping a client's menu reduce the size of their foot print of their hood, mm -hmm. have them go to my website. I I've written articles on all this. Is a, is a ventless kitchen possible? I wrote that almost 10 years ago now. And so, because I was blessed that some of the clients up here, I was on cutting edge of some of these things. And I used one of the first uh, non hood required uh, through ovens by turbo chef. And it's a tunnel oven. Now they have an, all these patents. He, the gi is too. All the patents have come off of most of these first time, first to market pieces of equipment. So all these manufacturers are getting into the speed oven categories and all across it. And you're seeing it in the trade industry, but I, I'm seeing it like here with these guys. I see it too. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I think that's a huge thing from a design, but also from them thinking up front. Okay, here's my menu. Now, if I get this and this and this, and I do some research on my own, then I get an expert involved that knows this stuff. We can put this together. And re if you reduce that hood, those hoods, a type one hood anymore is, at least in my market, is uh, fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred dollars a lineal foot, minimal. If you can take a cup, hello, it's all it all comes to the bottom line, and okay. and that's going to be there for the life of your, <laughs> hopefully for the life of your restaurant. So I, those are the kind of things that I uh, that I really ponder because the biggest things that I can control for them is. The mitigating their HVAC, anything that that is outside hard costs that they have to deal with, which besides food and labor, they don't have much control over their stuff unless you have somebody 
that is designing those things or bringing in something new to replace something like a combi oven. And that will take place with three pieces of equipment in an old place. So there's just these things that can go back and help an existing restaurant if they're going to change their menu and they can broaden their menu in bars, especially. There's so many bar centric menus now and the equipment is there to do it without a hood all day. That's awesome. So that's cool that that, for really anybody. Yeah. You know, it's big. That's a big, big deal. We've covered a tremendous amount of ground today, Lou. I certainly appreciate your expertise. We've talked about acoustic and lighting design and finishes and budgets. And we talked about how you can save money uh, on labor with the right design, how you can, you know, pretty much increase your profits through great design. We've been all, I want to make sure that people go to your website because you do have a tremendous amount of resources there. That one article about, you know, ventless kitchens and all that, that's Mm -hmm. tremendous. I want to read that myself because it's interesting. And it's very appropriate that in the background you actually have uh yeah be, well i can turn my camera around and it'll I'm it'll show it <laughs> that makes i was it really thinking about that for me to you know to share your website and i just want to okay. make sure that uh it's lou s design associate or associate yeah. Com. Associates, no, plural associates. Yes, yeah, okay. so the ES. Yeah, essentially there. Lou S. Design Associates. Audience, mm-hmm. please take the time. Go if you're planning on a refresh. If you're planning on starting from scratch, you can learn so much just from Lou's website. And if you want to reach out to him, you know that's the place to do it. It's been tremendous having you as a guest, uh, and I appreciate your recommendation. Oh, thank you. And and everything. Well, link, LinkedIn is a very good place too, because because mm-hmm. that's my central. I've been on LinkedIn since 2000. And so for me as a design professional, that's where people can seek me out. But th- from that, they can see a lot of my background, but they can also have all my contact information on there. My, my email, I'm very transparent. My, my, my phone is my phone. It's my only phone I have is my cell phone. And uh, I have my website and my LinkedIn thing. So, but for, I wanted to make this suggestion to the, the, the audience that um, look for professionals on LinkedIn. If you, anybody, for anything, because... So that is where I get most of my people inquiring about me, for like you just said, to, to want expertise and other things. There's a lot of good people on there for other pieces of your business that you need that I don't do. Yeah. You yeah. shared a lot of great best. Well, thank you. Thank you. This, Lou, I, I appreciate having you as a guest. That was the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Thank you so much to our audience for tuning in, and we will see you in the next episode. Thanks again to Lou Schildemeyer from Lou thank F- Design Associates. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Oh, it's been great talking to you. Thank you, as always, guys, for tuning in. You know, we're restaurant operators. We're not designers. So I'm hoping you got lots of takeaway for your next makeover project, if that's on your plan. You know, let me talk a little bit about your menu, okay? I've really focused on menu design for maximum profit over the last year or so, and I've worked with multiple clients, and it's really amazing to me how often, you know, the lowest profit items on a restaurant menu are the biggest sellers. And sometimes, in many cases, there is a large profit difference between the lower profit items in each category, appetizers, entrees, desserts, as there is the high profit items. And when a low profit item takes sales away from the high profit, you could be losing three to five bucks every time in the appetizers. You could be losing seven, 10, 12, $15 or more on the entree side. And let's face it, you're paying your kitchen staff just as much to prepare everything, the low profit or the high profit. So I've got the solution. If this idea intrigues you, reach out to me. I offer a 30 minute complimentary consultation. My email is Roger. R-O-G-E-R at restaurantrockstars.com. Maybe I can work with you and we can transform your menu to increase your profits. If you like what you're hearing, please give us a review on iTunes. We really appreciate this. Um, The reviews help other operators, other general managers and owners find us. And we appreciate you listening once again. And we will see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to To the the Restaurant Restaurant Rockstars Rockstars Podcast. For lots of great resources, head over to restaurantrockstars.com. See you next time.